Hi everyone, Sherry with Branching Out here. I am excited to bring you guys a discussion today um, with some special needs moms about um, some of the things that we don't often talk about, which are those things that keep us up at night as special needs parents, um, the kind of unknowns and fears about our kids getting older and um, kind of the way society and the community expects them to be and how they interact with them and some of the dangers and things that come along with that. So um, in thinking about this topic, I really wanted to, um, you know, hear some other voices that I think can give us unique perspectives. So I have invited um, Amanda Steele. Hi, Amanda, she is, um, one of the directors over at Arc of Tempe. She is uh, a favorite well-known speech therapist in our area and she is um, mom to Jordan Wright. Um, Jordan is a young man who um, has experienced some of these challenges and inequities um, within the community and I think she has some unique perspective. Many of us um, you know recognize his name from the past year um, and then I've also invited um, one of our branching out moms, Julie Gunnigal. Um, she is a fellow special needs mom and an attorney, and she has a lot of insight for us on this. So let's go ahead and welcome our guests and get started. Let me change my view. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hello. So glad you guys could be with me today. Um, so I want to start by just giving some kudos to um, Julie. We are so proud of Julie. Um, many of us special needs moms know that the system is, um, is lacking for our children in many ways, whether it's educational, whether it's um, exploitation protections, um, any of those things. So, you know, Julie is a girl after my own heart in terms of seeing a problem with the system. And if you think you can do it better, you should step up and do it. Um, that's kind of how I always live and how branching out came to be. Um, so Julie has bravely decided to um, try to enter the system as Maricopa County attorney and try to make change and influence from the inside for kids like ours. So um, we know she's well versed and we just kind of wanted to include her in the conversation and thought she could give us some insight into some of the areas that we might not understand the inner workings of. So thank you for being with us, Julie. Oh my goodness, thank you for having me. Awesome. Okay, Amanda, do you wanna maybe talk a little bit? I know, you know, um, me as a special needs parent of younger kids and um, you know, a director here at Branching Out, I work with a lot of families. And I noticed that the fears and concerns that um, parents of older children have vary. Um, I think, I think the, the families with younger children, it feels very off in the distance. But for families like yours, it's very present. Um, do you wanna share with us some of the things that you and your community are kept up at night? Bye. Oh, what doesn't keep us up at night, right? <laughs> and it does go fast. I, I still remember when my son turned 12 and the doctor brought up, his PCP brought up the idea of guardianship. And I was like, oh, that's so far off. And now I'm, I'm, I've had to go through guardianship process and I had to learn a lot. And there's things that I learned today that I wish I would have known before we started the journey the first time, no matter how much we learn, it seems like we still have so much more to learn. Um, the things that keep me up at night are the fact that my son has had a mediocre school system. He has been thought of as less than due to his low verbal status, his entire educational career. Um, what keeps me up is what's next is voc rehab, day treatment programs. And when I have a son that I know is capable of so much more, if just given the opportunity and the right type of supports, he'd be able to be a very valuable member of the society. But unfortunately, our current systems, our current opportunities that are provided for our young adults that are entering 
um, they lack in every area that leads them into day treatment programs, that leads them into continually, continuously being excluded, that leads them into continuously being put in positions where the, if they are put into the community, they spend their entire times like my son in a self-contained environment and now he's 20 years old and has to go into the community and I have to worry about someone understanding that some of his behaviors are not what people consider normal, but it's actually what helps him. So these behaviors have led him to having police interactions and if my husband wasn't around, it would have gone very negatively. Um, so his behaviors have led him into being a victim of bullying and we're, Teens ended up with felony charges because of his, because of his behaviors, because of the way they perceived him. And it's honest to goodness because he's been kept away from the community all these years that the community doesn't know him for the amazing person he is. It's I mean, if you normalized what it it's, is, it's exactly right. If you could just normalize it, because when he walks into a tournament um, for Special Olympics and he comes doing his stim running and happy as all get out. He's not looked at differently, but if he were to do that in a place in the community that's not familiar, some would possibly think drugs, mental health. They would not go to automatically assume this child is releasing the energy that he needs so that he can go perform at his very best when he goes into that building. Right. right. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of concern about exploitation. Um, with these kids and, um, you know, with our girls a lot, we live in, you know, and our boys too, but we live in a state that is um, kind of a hotbed for, for trafficking. We, um, we know that these kids are so much more vulnerable to predators of all kinds. Um, and I mean, your situation with Jordan this past year I would consider that exploitation so was the know, as well, even though, um, you know, they were his high school peers and, you know, maybe they didn't have his hands on his, his body, but he was exploited in that situation. And that's a huge fear for all of us too. Um, one thing I've thought a lot about as um, a mom with, with, my most involved son, as many of you know, I have three DDD kiddos. Um, my one son that is most involved, I often am really thankful that he is of small stature um, and that that's going to, as he gets older, um, be an asset for me to be able to help manage him and keep him safe. Um, but a lot of parents have sons like, like Jordan, who's a tall strapping young man and I, I've had lots of worry over the years about, um, you know, what looks like when your child is having a meltdown in the store. And I know Julie, we've had these, <laughs> we've had these discussions about Julie's son and some of his, you know, more, more notable meltdowns. Um, you know, it looks like a, a seven-year-old is being a brat in the store and people kind of roll their eyes or, you know, make a judgy look and keep on going. But when your 22 year old is having a meltdown in the store, that can very much look like assault. Absolutely. Or um, like you said, someone on drugs or something like that, um, who's, you know, throwing cereal boxes on the floor. And, you know, if you're trying to apply deep pressure, it can look like he's mauling you. <laughs> You know, um, and so that's something I think most of us moms get really concerned and fearful about. And so um, I don't know. What are some of the things that keep you up, Julie? Yeah, you know, I, I think the thing that bothers me the most is that I see a society that doesn't value my child and the amazing things that he can bring to this world right? Um, sometimes I feel like I'm a treasure hunter and I, you know, I found it and I just, but the rest of the world, the world can't see it. And I have to constantly advocate for him because he is so misunderstood. Um, and you so speak to me because today is his 12th birthday and we're having a lot of those conversations. Happy birthday, Thomas. <laughs> right? 
but you know, a lot, a lot of us special needs parents have gone to hell and back for our kiddos. Mm -hmm. By the time my kid was in first grade, he had been expelled or politely asked to leave nine different schools. And to this day, it gives me anxiety to fill out the spirit shirt form because that's when it would happen, right? As soon as those spirit shirts arrive, um, would be the conversation about, oh, I don't think this is a good fit, or we don't understand this behavior, or that's so strange that it ha doesn't happen at home because it's happening here at, here at school. And the other, the other thing that really bothers me that I know we, we've talked a lot about is how difficult it is to advocate for your own child. So I'm an attorney and this is something I'm passionate about. I take these cases, I go into IEPs and MET meetings and help explain the misunderstood children of the world and help them get the services that they need. And I can tell you the least effectual I have ever been and the case that has kept me most up at night have been trying to advocate for my own children. Yeah. It's just so very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, it's going to be an ongoing project to fight for our society to understand the misunderstood and want to keep our children, you know, safe from exploitation. But I mean, gosh, there's there's so much to just unpack there, right? We know that our special kids are disproportionately likely to be victims in the criminal justice system when they are victims. We know that the criminal justice system often doesn't, doesn't charge or appreciate um, uh, them and as a result are, are less likely to seek justice on their behalf. Mm -hmm. I'm also very concerned that my child would one day that meltdown in Costco where he's kicking down the cereal and um, would, would erupt into a criminal justice event where police to show to show up. And I'm also really concerned about how he talks to officers mm -hmm. uh, because my child is also very suggestible and a people pleaser. And it's a big issue um, in, in this system. Watch the making of a murderer, making a murderer on Netflix, the Brandon Dassey thing, and just were like, oh my gosh, that could be my kid. Because I can tell you, with one of my sons, if you tell him he did something enough times, he will tell you he did that. His brother, his 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 brother, who's the they're six weeks apart. We're we're an adoptive family, um, you know. He's figured that out, and he'll tell him enough times. You're the one who did that. You're the one who did that. And even though I saw the I saw the brother do it, and he doesn't know I saw him, he'll. My son will still say, no, mom, it wasn't him. I did it, you know, and he believes it enough if somebody tells him. So that's terrifying. Yeah. Speak to that a little bit. Yeah. I, gosh, you know, it's so, it's so scary and it's an opportunity that we really have to better educate. Um, I mean, our, our kids can be educated to an extent, but man, it's really got to come from, from prosecutors. It's got to come from law enforcement. We have to build healthy and safe and sustainable relationships between the special needs community and law enforcement because we know uh, it's everybody's worst fear but it, for many it's an inevitability that we would one day end up interacting with that system. Mm -hmm. Yeah because statistically um, kids with special needs are much more likely to interact with the criminal justice system right and that's what you were sharing with me? They're much more likely to interact with the criminal justice system. They're much more likely to be exploited as well. Um, I mean, two staggering statistics are kids are three times more likely to be the victims of sexual assault. They're eight times more likely to be the victims of theft or robbery. So we, I mean, and those are just two of many, many offenses. So, and, and I mean, part of the problem is too, justice writ large. I mean, our, <laughs> when you have a suggestible, child like that. It's not just that they're more likely to implicate themselves, but man, to, to implicate the, another person or, or a wrong person or incorrectly identify someone is a, is a really big risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a really big risk that they won't be understood and some of the behaviors that, you know, are, are normal to them and normal to us as, you know, special needs families won't be understood by, by the system and will be thought of as signs of 
of fabrication um, or you know signs of unreliability, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a really big risk. Yeah, we've talked about um, you know this is something that kind of always comes up in my discussions with families and sessions with families is that um, for whatever reason mothers are often not heard that even when we do advocate and speak up for our children, we are not heard. Um, whether it's in the school system, whether it's in the healthcare system or the legal system, um, we aren't really acknowledged as the subject matter expert on these people, these young people, our, our person, you know? We know them better than anyone. We have watched every intervention happen. We have worked with every type of therapist that has come through. We have seen what works. We have been the consistent care provider throughout their life. So we, we are the most likely to know what makes these kids tick and how to understand and decode um, behaviors and things like that. But we're often, um, being as over emotional or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and our voices aren't given a lot of credit. I see that often in, in my work with families where, um, you know, I will work with an entity, whether it's, you know, educationally or medically or whatever. And I will just, you know, parrot what mom said in a letterhead email and it suddenly is heard. You know, I will share the same things that mom's been saying for 10 years and it's suddenly heard somehow by an outside person. So that's a that's a big, probably a big challenge in um, for all of us in terms of making change um, within these different systems is, it's hard to be heard, right Amanda? Absolutely hard to be heard. I, uh, as I grew up, Having a child very young, when I have, as I have a twenty-year-old, um, as I grew up way later, uh, two years ago, I handed a twelve-hundred-word document to be added to Jordan's IEP on everything that what, what everything they were not putting into his IEP, all the stuff that and all the successes that we were seeing at home, all of his outside community activities, and I was told by the special education director that no one's going to read this. You need to take this and cut it in until at least maybe a quarter of what this is because no one's going to read this. But this is him, these are his accomplishments, his goals. I broke it down into his each different self-help area academically and I was basically told no one's going to read this, we're not going to put this on here. And that that's even an option, right? To just- yeah. <laughs> That was the parent input, you have to put that on there. Just choose to not read the briefings, to not, you know, read the information that's so valuable to understanding who this human is, who this person is. He's more than just the deficits and the interventions, right? Exactly right. Yeah. So Julie, let me ask you, in, you know, you've been very active in the community, you know, for years in terms of um, parents' rights and, you know, healthcare and, um, school system. So you've kind of like worked on tackling those areas of concern. What is it about county attorney that you're hoping to do and accomplish and what kind of motivated you to um, tackle that next, I guess? Yeah, you know, when I look across Arizona, um, so my, my background in past, I'm a former prosecutor of politicians. Mm -hmm. Right. And as I was going down to the Capitol and, you know, advocating for our kiddos and our monumentally underfunded, you know, public health and uh, public school system, I, I was just uh, shocked with the corruption <laughs> that quite honestly happens. And I look at that as the big problem that we can solve here in Arizona. And I, I just see this office as the intersection of, of the big problems. Um, it's not just being able to, to tackle that and, you know, <laughs> free up those funds and provide transparent government that actually cares about our kids. Um, it's also how these kids interact with the criminal justice system. So to, to give you a, a couple of ideas about just where this intersection lies, 
Um, I have handled so many cases for dyslexic um, students. This is a population that in Arizona for the longest time wasn't receiving any funding. There was no, um, there was no standardized screening. And we really need to be looking at this group of kiddos and providing services because guess what? 50% of those who are in our adult prisons have dyslexia. It's almost that we need to start looking at this particular learning disability um, as, a, as an ACE, right? Um, it's shocking. It's shocking how overrepresented um, kids who would have qualified for IEPs and kids with IEPs and 504s are represented in our criminal justice system. It's absolutely disproportionate in our juvenile system um, how many have an intellectual or uh, developmental um, disability. Um, I would also note that that also uh, overlaps with, with academic aptitude as well. Uh, we know when it comes to giftedness, for example, three to 7% of our students are, are gifted and are not having their needs met. Guess what? They're between 15 and 25% of our high school dropouts. And again, disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. And then when you add, you know, this underfunded education system and overlap, you know, other systemic issues, like the influence of race on criminal prosecutions or the influence of being an LGBTQ um, kiddo, uh, you end up with really disproportionate outcomes. And it's uh, the, where the only fair assessment is that the criminal justice system does not value our special kids. It doesn't. And that's the big thing that we can change. So what is, when you see the current situation in Maricopa County in, you know, that office, um, do you have a, a good sense of where the breakdown is in terms of connecting with this population and, and maybe the motivation to understand and train better on it? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's be real. My kid is 12. And while I am the subject matter expert on him, it's taken an awful lot of time to, to understand him. And I'm not even going to fully claim to, you know, fully understand not just, you know, my care, but so many of the other uh, children that I've represented throughout, like, for example, the education process. Mm -hmm. It takes, um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of understanding. And that's, in my view, the biggest breakdown. Um, one of the things that this office has done, for example, they did a training for their prosecutors um, on mental illness, not the population that we're talking about, but you know, tangentially related. And the take that the office had was that people were faking it. Mm -hmm. And when you have an office that's that not committed to understanding the population that it claims to serve, um, you end up with some of these, these big breakdowns. I know throughout my career, um, one of the cases that, that stands out is I used to prosecute child on child sexual offenses in Indiana. And I once had a child um, who was uh, the, the alleged victim in a case. He was seven and he had some profound language issues. His pragmatic speech, which is a word I learned far later in my career, was the issue. Um, but I had the resources available to me um, from a fellow, you know, advocate who had a special kid who was able to teach me how to ask the questions that I needed to ask of him to be able to best represent, you know, him in court and get the conviction and get justice and accountability. So as I'm looking at, at our system, um, it seems to me just to be a misplacement of priorities. These kids in these cases take time and they take expertise and when your bandwidth is filled with low, nonviolent, low-level drug offenses, instead of focusing on this really important population and giving them the time and the bandwidth, that's where you're going to end up with a big disconnect. Okay. Yeah. So it's really just, um, you know, for most people, I feel like the world doesn't understand our kids, but if given the opportunity to engage with our kids, people people tend to be understand and be more invested, and which is why at Branching Out we work so hard at community inclusion because I'm all about planting. I always tell my staff we're planting a seed in future allies for these kids. They, they might not, it might not mean much right now, but if they see in the future, 10 years from now, 
a special needs indiv individual with special needs being bullied on public transit or something like that, if we planted that seed and they had a positive interaction with kids like ours, they're more likely to stick up for them. They're more likely to, you know, help them get help um, in situations like that. And so maybe we're just kind of the county attorney's office just hasn't had exposure, enough exposure, positive exposure with people of this population to be invested in wanting to help them get help. Mm -hmm. Sounds like. Wow, that's some, some big stuff. So what can that position do to affect change for our population? Yeah, a, a few different things. Um, first, we can provide real justice and accountability um, for, for our kiddos. And we can do that by better training our prosecutors so that kiddos like ours are, are understood in the system. Um, when our children interact in a negative way with the criminal justice system, we can have a county attorney who is committed to protecting their rights, to involving their parents, which has been huge, right? Um, one of the things that, that very much scares me is if my child were ever questioned without me present, uh, what, what he might say, um, because I know the strange things that come out of his mouth when it's, when it's strangers or when it's somebody, not me, and I just feel like he needs, he needs that advocate um, there. Um, I think we can have a system that is more informed, that is more caring, truthfully, that is more peaceful when it interacts um, with our with our kiddos. We can have somebody who's who's going to be a a voice for that. Um, and then last, we can have a system when when our kiddos interact or as adults interact with the criminal justice system, we can fight toward toward fairness. Um, it is not fair that we are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And I think that's because we've criminalized um, so much. What looks like a, what looks like deep pressure and a hug at seven looks like an assault at 22. And the behaviors that I'm, that I'm seeing now with my, with my kid could translate later uh, to, a, to a criminal event. And that's what we can change. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, what was it, a year or so ago, we saw um, a young adult out with their, um, I'm assuming it was probably like a habilitator, um, and he had a toy in his hand, and the police somehow got involved thinking it was a gun or something, and the habilitator actually got shot because they felt like, um, I'm sure that part was <laughs> unintended, but... Uh, the they felt like the young man was a threat to the community out walking around with his habilitator um in situations like that how how can we impact from the county i know we have the county you know the sheriff's department but within the county we have lots of other law enforcement departments um is there a way that this position translates to um whether it's you know pressure or collaboration with getting adequate training around special needs yeah yeah absolutely so um this office has a ton of weight a ton of pull and a ton of advocacy attached to it right okay. um it is not your chief of police but it is a real voice for justice and when it comes to uh, when it comes to justice, one of the things we can advocate for is a lot better training at our different police uh, offices. We can also advocate for accountability for those officers, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's the thing that, in my view, has, has really been lacking. Um, Arizona had a spate of police and officer-involved shootings. In fact, Phoenix was number one in the entire country when it came to officer-involved shootings. This office charged out of, you know, over two years um, of record setting shootings charged a single person and wasn't able to get a conviction. Mm. Um, so I think it has to be education, but it also has to be education coupled with accountability because if there's no accountability surrounding it, um, then there's, then there's no teeth and we're going to continue to see the status quo. Yeah. We need, we need people to see our young adults, um, in this population, in this community, not as such a threat. Um, 
we need to see them as, as you know, they can't necessarily see their developmental age on the outside, but we need them to be able to look for the signs and be able to see that it's an individual who's having a hard time, not, not giving you a hard time. Um, right, Amanda? That's, I mean, absolutely right. Parents all the time kind of reframing they're 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 stressed and they've gone into whatever mode they're going to be it freeze flight or fight mm -hmm. and for a lot of our kids that are overstimulated they go straight into fight mode and when someone comes in fighting back it's going to continuously cycle into what we're seeing yeah and we all know you know we all know wonderful officers and you know they Absolutely. go to work and they, you know, do, do the best for the community, but if we don't give them those tools or resources to understand, um, you know, these kids and kind of decode um, these situations in a way that they don't feel threatened in, um, and they're not going to escalate, um, you know, if we're not doing that and giving them those resources, we're doing everyone a disservice, and you know, including them. Absolutely. You have to train everybody because you're always going to have those few that in school join best buddies. So when they're adults in jobs, there are so many law enforcement torch run officers that my family has gotten to know. And my son has a lot of respect for police and we have taught that and we went years and years having him introduce himself. But in his one situation where he was thought of as he was dressed in clothing that matched a suspect. Mm -hmm. And he had headphones on and he wasn't ignoring, but he was walked up with a gun, with guns pointed at him. And if it wasn't for my husband to come running out saying, stop, that would have gone completely, completely different. Um, but we, if we train everybody, I feel the same way in schools because schools only really offer training for those who want to take training on special education or special needs. Um, Tempe Union, where my son is at, they brought in training, but 60% of the people in that classroom were special education teachers that were learning about special education training. <laughs> um, so I think it should actually be mandatory that everybody has some form of training and not only mental health, but developmental health. Yeah, and for those families who um, are joining us who aren't familiar with Jordan's situation and the monumental efforts that went in to getting it the attention that it needed. Um, I have to commend you on your advocacy and the tirelessness that went into getting pressure on the powers that be to make them finally do something. Yes. So share that a little bit with us. Absolutely. So do you want me to start at the kind of the beginning of what happened? Tell us what happened and kind of how much support you had to rally to make this go anywhere. Okay, absolutely. So November 15th, 2018, I received a phone call from my son's school saying they needed to talk to me, that I needed to come in. She refused to give me any information on whether he was safe, if he was okay, just that I needed to come in. So I canceled my session, went to the school, and I was shown a video. And the video was three total videos, um, like clips put together. The first video was a young woman who put her face in the screen and laughed and made fun of him, called him every word that we try to avoid keeping in our homes, obviously. Um, and then she found him in another location on the school and she recorded him some more. So at that point we have, knowing he has a disability, so in my opinion, you have harassment, you have um, stalking because she found him in another location, videotaped him some more. And the things that she was doing were hate crime because she was basically mocking him directly for his disability. Um, she then attached it to a second teenager's video. Same day, he was in the same clothing where this teenager walked into the restroom and saw, thought the way my son standing at a urinal was hilarious. And so he videotaped him and he shared it on Snapchat. And so the young woman that was also bullying him that day connected it all into one. So I saw all three videos. So there were a total of three teens involved. The boy that took the video in the bathroom, um, that was a surreptitious video because it did show body parts. Um, he shared it with one girl who then posted it on social media. So there was a second teen, a 15 year old. Um, and then there was the girl that mocked him and made fun of him. 
that was probably one of the most heart-wrenching ones because she has a brother with autism. So that was definitely very hard. Um, I went to the school, told them I did not want to sue them. I wanted to pursue charges. They gave me a night to speak. They were supportive in every way they possibly could be, except for, for writing anything down and actually following through with a lot of things. Um, I was definitely left in the dust at the end, um, both at the board level, the district level, and the school level. Um, they said his anxiety that he grew afterwards was because of other things going on in his home that had nothing to do with the school, even though they weren't letting him use the public restrooms anymore. They weren't letting him walk the school freely. He had to be with an aide at all times. And remember how I mentioned the stimming, he's a runner. They allowed him to run through the school for the first five years. And then all of a sudden he's being told, you have to stop and wait for the slowest person when you're the fastest person in the class. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't support me, uh, unfortunately, but I did stick it through and I, uh, Lots of, lots of rallying and lots of rallying had to bring a lot of people together um, brought it to the news because I basically shared it with the community. The school obviously did not want that to happen, but I wasn't being listened to. I mean, he, the, the SRO officer at the school handed me a card and said that someone would be in touch. He was absolutely no support whatsoever after that. He doesn't even look me in the eye when I go to the school, um, but he did nothing. About a month later, I finally went through so many different like department heads and everything. I finally got someone to agree to my case, but then they realized that he was over 18, so he couldn't be in this department. So they had to transfer him to another apart department. It was well over a month before I finally talked to a Phoenix police officer. And then in January, after it had been transferred through three different police officers, I got an email saying she had put it into the court system that they were pressing charges. We were gonna go forward. And in April, I was told that they still hadn't done anything. They, she like she still hadn't even actually put it through. Um, May we finally had the court date and October was the last one. So we went, each of them kept on getting over, like we had to come back because they wanted more time. They wanted to plead their charges. All three students did get felony charges, but the young lady that created her own video, um, she did not get any charges on that. She just had the surreptitious charge. So they all had, <laughs> they all had to do sensitivity training, but none of that would have happened. They all had to volunteer with like Special Olympics and stuff, um, but none of that would have happened if I wouldn't have stood through until the very, very end advocating for it because there was no one else there for me. No one from. You really, you really rallied the, the special needs parent community to show up and put pressure and you, I mean, it shouldn't take you having to further expose your son's story in order to get justice, right? He's already been so violated. His body parts have been recorded and put on the internet and that's out there now. Um, to, to draw more interest in it shouldn't be your only route to yeah. justice, right? You shouldn't have to have the news media all over it to get someone in the legal system to care about these violations against your child. Absolutely. The special needs community was amazing. When we did that night to speak, um, anytime that I needed support, every court hearing I went to, I had a group of people with me. I was never alone from the, commu from the special needs community. It was the justice system um, and the school system that truly, truly failed my son's situation. Yeah, and imagine, I mean, what a game changer, I guess, that can maybe be for our special needs community to have someone at the top of kind of the legal system in our state. Absolutely. Us. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> shows up for us. <laughs> what so bothers me, first of all, that does not surprise me that, that special needs parents rally because that's what we do. What we uh, do. And I can't say enough about the the positive community um, that that is here in Arizona and that Sherry, quite frankly, that you foster and build. It's amazing. But what bothers me so much about about stories like yours and what happened is when I was, when I was in school, we had a we had a special kiddo in our in our class and who was you know integrated at every. Um, at every grade level. And I remember one teacher in particular who, who and it was just a simple comment, um, talked talk down to that student. 
And when an authority figure does that, it gives permission to all of her students to treat that person differently. And when I hear that there are instances in our in our justice system where you know something needs to be it needs to be acknowledged and there needs to be accountability tied to it when there's big gaps like this it gives the rest of the community the idea that it doesn't matter that it's somehow allowed that it's okay to do this to these students and i mean that's that's in in my view even the, the greatest harm is the possibility of a repeat now that the community has seen that the, that these students are treated differently. Right, that's a really good point. It's a very good point. Man, some heavy stuff. So um, tell us, just so people know, um, you know, a lot of parents are really bogged down with COVID and their kids' programs being canceled, and they're just kind of keeping their heads above water. Um, for those who are interested in wanting to help, you know, a, a member of our special needs community be part of, you know, in leadership and being a voice in the in our criminal justice system, how how do we get involved? How do we help? What should we be looking for? For in terms of you and you know helping your voice be heard. Oh, oh, okay. Um, yes, absolutely. So <laughs> there's going to be a ballot in your mailbox. Um, if it didn't arrive yesterday, it'll arrive today. Um, and voting in this election is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's happened in this office is that we have had the status quo for a very long time. This is traditionally not an office that anyone has ever really contested and it's been in the control of, you know, a small group of insiders for more than 40 years, actually. Um, moreover, we have never elected a mom to this office. And I think that unique perspective matters, especially when our juvenile justice reform system is, is just so in, in need of someone who understands. And especially when we have a school to prison pipeline and like I've seen you know, how my kid would have been filtered through that pipeline. We need somebody who's gonna do something about it. So uh, you can find more about me in the kind of campaign that I'm running at gunnable2020.com. Um, and, you know, every voice needs to be heard. We love having volunteers and we have, uh, we have spaces for you if you want to make a big difference really fast um, and do it from the safety of your own home. Please check us out, gunnable2020.com. So you're a special needs mom. You're the only mom running, right? The only mom on one side of the ticket, and I'd be the first woman and mom ever elected to this position. Wow. Which, by the way, our county leadership, so Maricopa County uh, is, the, is the population of New Jersey. It's huge. It's 4.4 million people, right? Um, and in our executive county leadership, we have no female representation and we have no mom representation. And this is something that, that happens truthfully across the board. When you look at who's elected to Congress, uh, we don't elect moms, especially moms of young children. Uh, for whatever reason, we're more than willing to elect dads, uh, but it's one of the reasons why, you know, we don't have a fully funded education system because those who have skin in the game aren't at the table. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we don't have parental leave. We don't listen to our moms. It's one of the reasons why uh, when encountering the criminal justice system, moms are invisible. We have no voice in the system. Right. Yeah. So here we go. Moms. <laughs> moms, moms unite. The plate again. Here we go. Right. <laughs> just gotta be loud and and fight for these kids because you know nobody else is, and if we don't, who will? Right. So. Um, yeah, take a look, guys. Your, you know, your mail-in ballots should be there, and you know, we're just really proud of one of our branching out moms for taking this kind of brave and selfless step to step away from, you know, a successful career in the hopes of making a bigger change for all of the kids like ours. So thank you for sacrificing your time and um, putting so much heart into this, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you both so much. All right, guys, um, we will go ahead and put a link um, for you to learn a little bit about Julie. You know, we're not, um, our, 
I, you know, our agencies, mine and Amanda's, um, we aren't politically affiliated typically, um, but we do really like to support the families um, within our community that are working hard to make a difference regardless of, um, you know, their, their affiliations or, or whatever. So um, this is huge that a special needs mom is really running this far with the baton for us. So we felt like we really wanted to understand better um, what was, what this was all about and, um, how we can help and how we can support, make a difference for our kids. So thank you all for joining us. We'll be seeing you all soon. Thank you, ladies.